Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Our Savior's is a congregation of people forgiven in Christ, whose mission is to proclaim the good news and connect faith to everyday life. We are glad that you've chosen to worship with us. Our traditional worship, one of our six weekly services, will begin in a few moments. Welcome to worship here at Our Savior. It's good to gather together to worship God, to lift our voices in thanks and praise for all of God's good gifts. A warm welcome to everyone, of course, but especially to those who are guests or visiting with us today and to those who join us on television. We think of you often and we're happy that uh, God calls us together in this way to worship our Lord. Before we begin, I want to share several announcements with you so that uh, <clears throat> you have the information we want you to have. Today is a big day for our congregation. We're gathering for a special congregational meeting about 12.15 or so. A little light lunch will be served in the gathering place, but the purpose of the meeting is to vote on extending a call to Justin Kosek, a pastor who is currently serving in Long Island, uh, but to call him here to serve as our pastor of outreach and communication. So we anticipate that meeting to be one of uh, great conversation and uh, prayerful discernment. We hope that you'll join us. We've been talking about the Reformation 500 worship service that is coming up on November 1st. It's a Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, out at the arena. Some 3,200 people have already claimed their free tickets online. And we want to encourage you, if you haven't yet done so, to do the same. It's quite easy. Go to the South Dakota Synod website. If you need help with that, contact the church office. But this service will not only mark an historic Lutheran milestone, not everyone celebrates their 500th birthday, right? But it will also be a celebration, a looking forward into a future of greater unity among all Christian churches. In fact, there will be Presbyterians present, there will be United Methodists present, there will be Episcopalians present, there will be Roman Catholics present for this worship service. So come and be a part of that great celebration. If you would like to <clears throat> avoid all of the traffic and hassles that come with parking out there, contact Pastor Tim. He has arranged for a shuttle service, so that is also an option for you. We want you to know that Friendship Club is this Tuesday morning, 10.30, as it typically is, in the Friendship Room. Next Sunday is our first cross-generational event. Sunday school is, is um, not scheduled for next Sunday, but for those who will be here, we will be having a cross-generational event that is part of Sioux Falls Rocks. And I understand that this project is going to involve painting rocks, one of which will be hidden somewhere that you decide, possibly discovered by someone else who may be blessed by your painted rock, and then rehide it to be a blessing to someone else. And then also you'll paint a second rock to bring with you back home. Should be a lot of fun and a great way to do church together across the generations. Finally, I'd like to call upon Lisa Parker, who's here from the Board of Youth Ministry, and uh, she has some words for us to consider about how we might be able to support youth ministry more robustly. <laughs> Hi, good morning. My name is Lisa Parker, and I am on the youth board here at Our Saviors. I need a little help. Who better to ask than my church family? I need a gift idea for my, ne my nephew's birthday coming up. They're so hard to buy for. An iTunes gift card, a gift card, you're right. That's a great idea. He can buy music and games. Any ideas for my niece in Michigan? 
An American Eagle gift card. That's a great idea. They do have that store there. How about my hard to buy for mother in law? Yes. Barnes and Noble gift card. A Barnes and Noble <laughs> gift card. She loves to read. That's a great idea. So I don't know how I'm going to get all these gift cards. I don't do all that online stuff. Wait a minute. I think I saw something in the bulletin this morning. That's right selling gift cards as a fundraiser. So did you know that 5% of that iTunes gift card would come back to OSL Youth Ministry? 10% of that American Eagle gift card would come back, and 9% of that Barnes & Noble gift card would help support the OSL Youth Ministry. You can shop hundreds of different restaurants, entertainment, retail clothing stores, and they're all part of our gift card program. We also sell High V and Fairway gift cards that you can pick up today. For all the number nerds in the congregation, did you know, on average, a family of four can spend anywhere from $700 to $1,200 a month on groceries alone? Doesn't count eating out. That can add up to over $14,000 a year just in groceries. If you paid for those groceries each month with the grocery cards that we sell, you could raise $700 a year to support the youth ministry here at OSL. That's money you're already spending with 5% going towards our programming and no extra cost to you. Now imagine if 50 families did that on a regular basis, $35,000 would be raised for OSL youth ministry and all you did was buy groceries. That would cover the youth ministry budget, the cost of youth trips and camps for the year, and there would be some despair. Please consider stopping out at the youth selling table outside the library in the gathering place and purchase your gift card or grocery cards today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lisa. Great job. And thanks for the help, wherever it came from out there. That's awesome. We're ready to begin worship. So I invite you to stand as you are able. And we begin where we need to begin. And that is by being honest with God and with each other and ourselves. We begin with the order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one who fashions us, the one who heals us, the one who reforms us again and again. Amen. Let us confess our sin, calling for God's transforming power as we pray together source of all life, we confess that we have not allowed your grace to set us free. We fear that we are not good enough. We hear your word of love freely given to us, yet we expect others to earn it. We turn the church inward rather than moving it outward. Forgive us, stir us, reform us to be a church powered by love willing to speak for what is right, act for what is just, and seek the healing of your whole creation. Amen. People of God, God hears our cry and sends the Spirit to change us and to empower our lives in this world. Our sins are forgiven. God's love is unconditional and we are raised up as God's people who will always be made new in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Take a deep breath and let that soak in, that good news of being forgiven. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share that peace with one another. We remain standing. Worship continues as we join voices in singing our gathering hymn.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We pray now for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. You rejoice in your church, gracious God. Welcome your children to the table you have prepared and send us forth to share the saving mercy we meet in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. You rejoice in your good creation. Provide moisture for parched places wind and sun for flooded lands, and shelter and sustenance for creatures of every kind. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. You rejoice in the people and places of this world. We pray for nations who cannot sit at table together, for leaders distracted by anxiety and fear, and for refugees unwelcome in their homelands. Lord, in your mercy. You bring peace that surpasses understanding. We pray for all who cannot worship with us this day, those who are homebound, imprisoned, or working. We lift up the names of those who are sick and need your help, Kristen Thee, Becky Held, Pamela Johnson, Gloria Platt, and Margaret Franken. We pray for comfort and peace for parents who have lost their children, especially for Arlen and Janine Thomas upon the death of their daughter Julie, and Don and Irene Person upon the death of their son Michael. Comfort their hearts and ours with your healing presence. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. You rejoice in this congregation. We pray for your wisdom as we gather today to discern whom you are calling as our pastor of communication and outreach. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. You rejoice in love and unity, so we pray for your blessing over the marriage of Rihanna Gullickson and Gregory Mayer, married here this weekend. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And you promise an eternal feast 
We give thanks for the saints of every time and place, especially Julie and Michael. Hold us in communion with them until all are united at your heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting the power of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite the children to come forward for Kid Talk. Come on up. I've got something I want to show you today, so come and join me on the step. You can sit right up here. Come on over this way, Dante. Or you can sit there if you'd like. So I brought something with you. Do you know what that is? Or with me, do you know what that is? Any ideas at all? It is a sugar beet. A sugar beet. You get sugar from a sugar beet. And I brought that with me because the last two weeks, I went up north to where I used to live, western Minnesota, and I helped in the sugar beet harvest. Farmers plant the seed, and from this tiny little seed grows a sugar beet. It grows much like a carrot or a potato, so it grows in the ground with some green leaves up above the ground. And when it's harvest time, the farmer has a machine that goes through the field and cuts off all the green leaves, and then he has another machine that lifts the beet out of the ground and through the magic of machinery gets it up into a truck. And you know what I got to do? I got to drive one of the trucks. I drove the truck alongside that machine and once my truck was full then I had to take it to where they piled the beets up and we made great big mountains of sugar beets. It was pretty fun. But I brought this along today to show you, first of all, I didn't think you had seen a sugar beet before, but secondly, to help teach something that Jesus teaches us. Hmm, I wonder what that might be. Well, I'll tell you. This table in our worship space, every Sunday when we gather for worship, we gather around a table. In fact, let's go over there right now, shall we? Come and join me. Down here, around this table. This is the table where we celebrate Holy Communion. Holy Communion. And it's really a table where we have a party. I know it's not exactly a feast, but, you know, much like we think about feasts, like Thanksgiving, what are some foods that we have at Thanksgiving? Turkey, maybe ham, mashed potatoes and gravy, all the good stuff, right? We don't get that here. We get a little piece of bread and a little cup of wine or grape juice, but it is a feast because we get things that are much bigger than the food that we get here. We get things like forgiveness of our sins, and we get the promise that we will live with God forever. That's why this is such a big deal. This is a feast that we celebrate every Sunday when we get together for worship. It's awesome. But I need you to imagine something for me. Let's imagine that sugar beet over there to be a person. Can you do that? Let's just use our imaginations and think of that sugar beet as a person. In fact, let's give him a name. Let's call him Steve. Steve the sugar beet. And we want to imagine him as a person because, you know, we're gathered around this table but part of our job as God's children is to invite others to join us here at this table. And sometimes people like Steve, well, they're not around the table. Maybe they haven't heard about Jesus' love yet. But our job is to tell them about that. Now, I, I'll grant you, people like Steve might be hard to invite. I mean, just look at him. He's, well, he doesn't look like us, right? And he doesn't exactly talk like us. And if you look real closely, he's kind of dirty, right? But you know what? How do you think Steve feels when he's not invited to a feast like this? Sad. And, and how do you think God feels when he knows that there are people in this world like Steve 
who aren't around the table that God has provided for us. I think God probably feels sad too. So our job is to invite as many people as we can. Dante, would you mind walking over and bringing Steve to join us here at the table? There you go. Yeah. Welcome to the Lord's table. Everyone, all are welcome here. You and Steve and all the other Steves of our world. This is where we receive God's good gifts of grace and experience the depth of God's love in our lives. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, God, for welcoming us at your table. Teach us how to welcome all people to this celebration of your good gifts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining me today. Dante, hold on to Steve. You guys can head back to your seats, but let's bring this down here, and we'll make sure Steve is gathered with us at the table. Thank you very much.
God speaks to us in scripture, preaching, song, and prayer. A reading from Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm, and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Word of God, word of life.
A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the Church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. Word of God, word of life. Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more, Jesus spoke to the chief priests and the scribes in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call on those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I've prepared a dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. And he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready. But those invited were not worthy. So go, therefore, out into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out and into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without wearing a wedding robe? He was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Is it hard to say praise to you, O Christ, after that? Little? It's hard for me. It's a tough parable, and it's not the first one of these that you've heard. Matthew's gospel contains all but one instance of the phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth. All but one in the whole Bible are in this New Testament gospel, in the words of Jesus. And trust me, I wondered many times this week, can we just stick to the psalm and feel good and talk about green pastures and still waters? That would be nice. It's too bad that the God of the New Testament is a God of wrath, while the God of the Old Testament is a God of grace. Yeah, Matthew blows that one out of the water. And these con this condemning story comes straight from Jesus' lips. The conflict and drama and violence of this text is not accidental. It was Matthew's way of addressing the conflict between among the, Jew, the conflict within the Jewish family that his original audience was dealing with. So even as Matthew told the whole story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he knew that he had to address this conflict that his audience would be wondering about as well. So Matthew relies heavily on Jesus' parables about sorting. The wheat from the weeds, the sheep from the goats, the good fish from the bad fish, the good tenants from the bad tenants, the good soil from the bad soil, the good bridesmaids from the bad bridesmaids. And in our story, the good guests 
from the bad guests. But oh, that sorting. It makes us so uncomfortable, especially us in our diverse world, multi-religious world, as Lutherans, as grace-filled people. It makes us shift in our seats. And the first time I preached this, my heart was just pounding like this the whole time. And I think that those reactions are appropriate. We fret and worry about who is good and who is bad. How do I make myself good? What if I make a mistake? What will happen to me? What kind of God would punish people? And how can we trust in God's grace when condemnation is on the table? I'm going to leave these questions unanswered here for a moment while we walk through the rest of the parable with some commentary and some paraphrase to try to get at the heart of what is going on here. And then we'll get into how all of this makes a difference for us. So listen to this parable again. Once more, Jesus spoke to the chief priests and the scribes in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. Do you remember the royal wedding of Will and Kate? Or maybe of Charles and Diana, too? There were months of speculation about the dress. And even what color would the queen wear? And at this time, I worked at a bank where the news was on 24-7. And I admit, I caught wedding, a royal wedding fever 100%. If I, though it's too wonderful to imagine, but if I had received an invitation to the wedding, I would have been there. And I wasn't alone. Two billion people around the world watched this wedding on television. And if you were one of those, you saw that the streets were just jam-packed with people just wanting to get a glimpse of the royal couple. This is the kind of event that you plan your whole year around, your life around. You don't let anything get in the way. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I can't help but imagine that a wedding of the king's son, like the one in this story, would have been a kind of can't miss it event. He sent his slaves to call on those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. What? They wouldn't come to Will and Kate's wedding? That's absurd. How could they say no? That can't be right. Now, allow me to paraphrase a little bit. Those people didn't... Uh, the, sorry, the king sent out the slaves to tell the people, seriously, this is going to be amazing. The food, the cake, the music, the dancing... Everybody's going to be there. Victoria Beckham's going to be there. Don't worry about it. Just come now. No worries. I'll see you there. But they didn't go because they had other stuff to do. That's absurd. And not only did they refuse the invitation, but these people killed the king's messengers who brought the invitation now that's just beyond absurd. It's unimaginable. So what is the king going to do about it? Will the king be gracious and understand? Or will the king respond to violence with violence this time? Back to the parable. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. I mean, what they did was terrible but burning the city it almost seems like too much i guess the wedding's off so then he said to the slaves the wedding is ready but those invited were not worthy so the party's on did god have the presence of mind did, sorry not god did the king have the presence of mind to keep the food warm while he went out to kill those murderers and burn their city Good planning, I guess. And then the king said, Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. The common, ordinary, even bad people were invited to the wedding. 
well, that's absurd, but I guess it all is. And at least it's a kind and generous and merciful offer. So this is a nice little bit of the story. Thank you. Good job, King. But it doesn't end there. When the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who wasn't wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? He was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So the guy, after all of this, the guy gets thrown out for wearing the wrong clothes. It was a last minute invitation. We can understand why he couldn't get a tux rental in time. And so what do we say to this? So many twists and turns, so much violence, so much drama, and this terrible ending. What can we say, but why? I struggled with this text, but I think there are two things for us. One of them is bad news, and one of them is good news. And I'm going to let you decide which one we do first. Do you want the bad news or the good news? Bad news? Are we in agreement? All righty. Bad news first. The sorting and judgment in this text is unavoidable. Honoring Matthew's gospel, we can't pretend like Jesus didn't tell a story with a king who threw out a guest who didn't belong because of something he failed to do. It's here, and we've got to take it seriously. Susan Brown explains, To say there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth is not necessarily to say that God designed these horrors. Perhaps these are horrors we bring upon ourselves, the inevitable fruit of rushing headlong into lives so self-absorbed that the whispers or even the shouts of God's messengers cannot reach us until it is too late. And it's not pleasant to talk about, but we know the consequences of an unfaithful life, the consequences of sin, the consequences felt in our bodies, in our relationships, in our work, in our failures, and even in the things that would appear to be successes, but that we achieved by unscrupulous means. We know what it is like to be cast out into the utter darkness. Yes, there is sadness and suffering in this life, and it comes as the result of sin. Ours or someone else's or sin that we participate in without even knowing it. Or a creation that is groaning under the burden of it. Sometimes people even suffer as a result of doing a good and faithful thing because our world is so perversely oriented around sin. I'm thinking of the unjust imprisonment of people like Martin Luther King Jr. or Nelson Mandela. But neither sadness nor suffering is God's judgment against us. What I think that Brown points out here is an important distinction between the temporary suffering that comes as a natural consequence of sin and our rejection of God and eternal salvation that comes as a result of God's steadfast love and faithfulness. The takeaway here, however, is not that sin is 100% unavoidable, so it's not even worth trying. God has given us gifts, most notably the Holy Spirit, to empower us to live according to the rules of the kingdom and not in bondage to sin. And while it might not sit well with some of us, this story points to the fact that God is asking more of us than passive faith. God is asking more, is asking of us more than passive faith, which just accepts God's grace and never makes a response. God is asking us to clothe ourselves, Colossians 3 style, with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, and over all of it, love. And beyond the scope of this parable, Christ has freed us from the power of sin, not so that we can wallow in the faith of our sin, but so that we can live lives marked by neighbor love and compassion and generosity and sacrifice 
so that we can live for the sake of others and not for ourselves. And this is true freedom from sin. And it is good news, though it is hard news. Ready for the really good news? Okay. Like the king, God invites everyone to the banquet and the hall is full. And there is room for everyone who comes. And you don't have to worry about your clothes, for in your baptism, you were clothed in Christ. And it is the most beautiful and costly garment you own, though you didn't pay a dime for it and you did nothing to earn it. For like the king, God invites the good and the bad, and I don't know about you, but that defines me almost all of the time, bad and good. And this worship service, it's kind of like a banquet. It's a preview, as David Lewicki writes, for every hundred people here, there are probably 150 reasons why you've responded to the invitation to come here. There are some of you who have come here to honor the Lord, some to obey parents, others to see your friends, a few because of some unshakable guilt, others to keep the peace in your marriage, others to be quiet without being alone, to listen for a word of hope, to grieve, and more. But regardless of the reason, all receive the forgiveness of sin and God's good grace in the bread and the wine. And though imperfectly, this gathering which is a preview of something much greater, is one of radical inclusion, and it stands as a countercultural witness to our world, which would separate us into smaller and smaller and smaller groups based on our differences of political opinions, our skin color, age, wealth, and all other categories that matter much to us, but not to God. Where we represent this diversity well, where we share food and drink, where we share life and love. It is a glimpse of God's glorious future and it is grace to us too. People of God, God invites us, all of us, to the banquet. Let us go now to the banquet. Thanks be to God. Let's confess our faith 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our worship continues with the giving of our offering, and I invite Pastor Heidi Vinstock to share an update from our mission partner, Westside Lutheran, beginning with this video. The Lord be with you. In September, Westsiders, as you can see from the video, celebrated our sixth birthday of Westside, worshiping regularly on Sunday mornings. It was in September of 2011 that regular Sunday morning worship began, and uh, Westside uh, began its journey of being church. But long before that, there were people, a congregation, our saviors, that was asked to be a partner in starting Westside to join together with the Synod, Peace Lutheran, and West Nidaros Lutheran in uh, thinking about and partnering in starting a church and dreaming of what it might look like for a church to be planted up in that northwest part of Sioux Falls, in which there were few public spaces at that time, no other churches, but lots and lots of people living. I was at Our Saviors as a pastor when those conversations started, and not surprisingly, Our Saviors responded generously to the ask because that's just what our saviors does. When I was a pastor here, I got to be an extender of that generosity on a regular basis. And now at Westside, I am the recipient of it, and I can tell you that your generosity makes a difference, and it matters. Because all of those pictures that you saw on the screen of our church family at Westside um, contain a Westside story. And in those pictures, you will find the story of two young parents who began coming to Westside when they were expecting their second child. A week after we baptized their daughter, whose lively spirit and attentive nature reminded me of my own daughter, Clara. Um, but a week after we baptized her, I found myself in the hospital visiting them as their daughter was uh, experiencing a virus and seizures that were just happening really frequently. Uh, for her, and that was just the beginning of their journey. And since that time, they have find, found themselves rooted, sometimes surprisingly to them, in a congregation that knows them, cares about them, and is their second family, an extended um, family when their family lives further away, being for them extra hands, listening ears, and more importantly, a community that reminds them that they stand on a promise that is bigger than any challenge they might face, that they have a promise of a God who is with them in all things and a promise that carries them in all things. Your support and generosity enables us to be a church to this young family. In those pictures that you saw on the screen, there is the story of an empty nester couple 
who counted themselves as church people and yet two decades had gone by and they hadn't stepped foot into a church. And so some friends invited them to come back to church. And that church was Westside and they came to Westside and they've been there ever since. She told me later that she didn't know that she was missing God's word of forgiveness in her life until she heard it again in church and it washed over her and it was like she could breathe freshly after a long time of not having that. This is what I've been missing, she thought. Your generosity to Westside has built a church whose primary mission is to proclaim this good news of forgiveness and a God who loves. Um, and it's proclaimed in word, in service, in community, in song, whenever we gather together. I know that Westside is not the only recipient of our Savior's generosity, that you are givers and that outside of these walls, both inside and outside, uh, your generosity uh, has a strong reach. I know that Westside is but one of many recipients of it. But I'm here to tell you today that your generosity is making a difference to a little church, uh, becoming bigger every day, but a little church to the northwest part of Sioux Falls. And we are grateful for you. We feel your strength. We feel your faithful witness. We feel your partnership. And we depend on you and are grateful for you and know that your uh, generosity to us matters. And so we give thanks. Thank you for joining us in worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For more information about Our Saviors, please visit our website at oslchurch.com. We invite you to join us again next Sunday morning. Until next time, may God's abundant love and blessings empower you to share the good news of Jesus Christ.